I'm getting somewhat behind in my Bible reviews because I've been reading this book. It is uh, 888 pages long, just the text. And it is entitled, The Reformation is Renewal, Retrieving the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Faith by Matthew Barrett. He's associated with Credo Magazine online. There's the look at the ISBN, if that's in focus. And here's sort of a thumbnail publisher's view of uh, what this is. It's a history of the Reformation, which the publisher calls holistic and eye-opening. And it demonstrates that the Reformation was at its core a renewal of evangelical Catholicity. So he listens to the Reformer's own voices, the author does, and helps us explore the Reformation's roots in patristic and medieval thought. And I think what he does in terms of patristic thought is stronger than what he says in terms of medieval thought. I didn't really pick up on the connection there as I read through the book. So let's take a look at dimensions. This volume is nine and a quarter inches tall. It is about six and a quarter inches wide and cover to cover about two and an eighth of an inch. Those of us with older eyes are always interested in font size. This appears to be about 11 points. And the paper is very opaque. The show through is not a problem. The font in the footnotes is much smaller, of course, but to my eye, it appears to be about eight and a half points. Publisher is Zondervan Academic. And here is the copyright page. This is the second printing from 2023. Dedication that includes a quotation from Philip Schaff. And now let's look at the table of contents. We have a foreword by Carl Truman, followed by a chapter entitled The Catholicity of the Reformation. We'll take a brief look at that. Then we have four parts. Part one, the Reformation's Catholic context. And that page takes you through page 369, 370 or so. And Part two, the genesis of Reformation, where we begin to talk about Reformation characters like Martin Luther. Part three, the formation of Reformed Catholicity, focuses on Calvin and Bullinger and the Church of England. Part four is simply one chapter, Counter Renewal, which is about the Counter Reformation. And then we have various other bits at the end, the conclusion and afterward acknowledgments, abbreviations, and so forth. This is a key paragraph, I think, from the foreword by Carl Truman. Protestantism long labored under the accusation from Catholics that it represents a set of deviant innovations. Now we know and can prove that this is not the case to the extent that Protestantism is confessional, to the extent that it's committed to the teachings embodied in a document such as the Westminster Confession. It is Catholic, with a small c and represents what Calvin and his contemporaries claimed it to be, not a repudiation of the Church's tradition, but an affirmation of the Church's true tradition over against the fallacious additions under which it had, it had been buried. Early in the first chapter, there's a section entitled, Who is Catholic?, which makes reference to Calvin's reply to Sadoletto, in which he said, essentially, that the Reformers were more Catholic than Rome. He quotes, uh, Calvin is saying, With this universal Catholic Church, we deny that we have any disagreement, nay, rather, as we revere her as our mother, so we desire to remain in her, in her bosom. Our agreement with antiquity is far closer than yours, Calvin told Sadoletto. Then here on the following page, one need not be a Protestant to recognize this conspicuous historical truth the Reformers did not think the Reformation was primarily a revolution for new modern ideas, but a retrieval and renewal of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Then you see a related paragraph. This is from David Steinmetz. Another section in this first chapter is entitled Interpretations of the Reformation, and a portion of that is lamenting the Reformation as schism and the seed of secularism. So this is the secularization narrative. 
Another way of looking at the Reformation is to celebrate it as modernism's liberation or radicalism's opposition. Then the author says toward the bottom of the page, yet whether lamentation or celebration, each of these interpretations in various ways returns to a common root problem, sola scriptura, the priesthood of all believers, personal and subjective interpretation, and the rejection of a sacramental worldview, all combine to create a reformation that represents the antithesis of Catholicity. He then introduces another stream of interpretation that he says has prevailed, but this time within the ranks of those who claim to be the Reformation's own heirs. And then on the following page, he elaborates, he says that Protestants have sometimes cultivated an interpretation of the Reformation that is not all that different from the historical assumptions of modern liberalism. Evangelicals have sometimes embodied the same presupposition toward the Reformers, but for the purpose of perpetuating a modern Biblicism instead. And so, this sets the context for the inset. So, since the author is bringing up a Biblic Biblicist interpretation of the Reformation, he thought it fitting to include here an inset, and there are numerous such insets in the book, and this one discusses the question, what is Biblicism? I'm not going to read it to you on camera, but I'll pan down so that you can read it. Dr. James White had a video in which he purported to be puzzled as to why this inset was here, but when I saw his video, I'd already read most of the book, and I was puzzled by his puzzlement. The author sometimes introduces terms before he has defined them. Here we have Via Moderna and Via Antiqua, which were described later in chapter 5. We're still looking at chapter 1 here in page 27. And this gives us some background, because Luther himself was trained in the Via Moderna soteriology, and the year they had ignited the Reformation, 1517, was the same year Luther opposed the Via Moderna through a public disputation. So this he uh, sets up as part of the significant context for the Reformation, this um, disagreement between the Via Moderna and the Via Antiqua. The volume is lightly illustrated here in Chapter 4 on Thomas Aquinas. You see a little picture by Matthew Barrett. Another example of an illustration here on page 211. And another on page 365. It is in this chapter that you'll find the argument that uh, the Reformers were basically in continuity with Thomas. This paragraph you're looking at here and the following paragraph, particularly the uh, material in italics at the bottom of the page, and that that you find at the top of the following page. There are a number of typos I found in the book without attempting to proofread it carefully. Dr. White mentioned one in that table on Biblicism that we saw earlier. Here's one on page 340 fairly confident that he means to say Pope John the 22nd. One of the things I like about this book is that it's presented from a theological perspective. The theological aspects of the history are emphasized. Uh, there's also politics here, but uh, theology, I think, takes the top seat. But here, on page 493, I must say that I didn't really understand what he was saying about Luther's view of the sacrament. And I think it would have been better had he explained it more carefully. Something else I think that could be improved perhaps in a future edition is that rather than giving a reference to LW, which I believe is Luther's works, volume 37, tell us the actual name of the work in the footnotes. I believe that would be very helpful. Now, if you're at all interested in this book, I hope you've been pausing and reading the passages as I make my random and disconnected observations. Here's one on page 590. I think there's a typo here. The sentence reads, when Melanchthon read the account, for example, he said to Luther in a letter that Melanchthon, Melanchthon said that Melanchthon was insane for doubling down on his view of the Eucharist. I think that should be Zwingli. So you can see the controversy was 
controversy between Zwingli and Luther was discussed there. Here we are on page 606, talking about the second Helvetic confession. So that topic clearly is discussed in the book, but I just wanted to point to another typographical error here as well. The confession was so successful because it managed to commit itself to Protestant distinctives and at the same utilize conciliatory language. I think time goes in there. Chapter 14 is entitled Constructing a Reformed Church, the Reformation in Strasbourg and Geneva, and it begins by talking about Martin Bootser, but it doesn't give very much background information on him. We know the approximate date of birth was 1491, and that he died in 1551. But uh, although we hear about the childhoods of both um, Luther and Calvin, there's very little here about Bootser. And as I just mentioned, he does, the author does give some background on Calvin. Um, one thing that's uh, a probable typo is here towards the bottom of the page. Uh, yet one revealing change has surfaced from around the year 1533, some say 1554, Calvin's conversion. Clearly that is 1534 there. Personally, the portion of the Reformation that interests me most is the English Reformation. That's what I've read most about. And I like what he's done here, particularly in making it clear that although Henry did break with Rome, Henry himself remained very much a Roman Catholic, pre-Reformation type Catholic until he died. And the Reformation in England really began with uh, the ascension of Edward VI. Um, he does talk about the martyrs under Mary. I'll turn there in just a moment. Here's another illustration, the famous portrait of Henry VIII, Holbein. Some text from the Act of Supremacy of 1534. And uh, talk a bit about Mary's reign. I think after the vernacular Bibles, there's Lady Jane Grey, and then uh, Mary in the Hunt for Heresy. I just wanted to mention that my Eastern Orthodox friends on the internet often point out that uh, Tertullian was not a church father, and I think they're right, but it does use that terminology here in talking about the execution of Hooper. The book's history of the Council of Trent is very helpful, particularly in giving insight into the political situation that caused it to um, be held and then dismissed and then reconvened multiple times. One of the things I was a bit disappointed in as I was reading it um, is this section on page 878, where they're talking about Trent and the doctrine of justification. And they make this claim in quotations, the Council excluded what had previously been acceptable Catholic teaching on justification. It gives a reference to a book by Lane, Regensburg, Article 5 on justification. But it uh, seems to me that that should have been included in the text. If we're making the case that Rome is discontinuous with its past, in order to amplify our argument that the Reformation was in continuity with the Catholic past, would have been nice to have had some more details here. Another recommendation I have for improvements is to include topical headings under the basic headings here in the subject index in the back of the book. So you have many, many references, say, to council here in the left column or created in the right. But if you had in mind a particular reference to created or council, you would have to look through all of these different sections to find uh, the one that you recall having read. Um, it would be helpful to have subtopics mentioned there and to have the references organized by subtopics. And so that was my quick overview of this book. I uh, did enjoy it. I'm glad I read it. It uh, was quite an investment in time to make it through all the way. Um, I do feel that the author has a good point that the Reformation certainly is in continuity with the past, but 
I imagine that it would be very easy for someone to write a similar book uh, emphasizing the discontinuities. So it's good to keep both in mind. There are things that are similar and things that changed. And the philosophical question would be, what's the essence of the church and how much change could the church endure because it is to, to cause it to become essentially different? What, um, what changes are essential and which are super, simply superficial? Well, thanks very much for watching. Uh, we'll be getting back to Bible reviews in the very near future.